Hello, hello, and welcome back to CS492A, Unconventional Computing at KAIST in Fall 2024. Today, and in the coming lectures, I will give some presentations, providing you with an overview Okay, yeah, computer glitch. Providing you with an overview of different models of uh, unconventional computing and thus preparing you for your own presentations after the midterm exam. So I will repeat the conditions for passing this course and I will also write it again in KLMS so you're supposed to attend most of the sessions. Details will be <clears throat> explained later. And you will, you're supposed to study to learn your assigned topic, your assigned chapter in this book, Unconventional Computing, and to prepare and to give a presentation, presentation of 40 to 60 minutes length, so aim for like 50 minutes. You're encouraged to include some video in this presentation, but not too much, roughly like <clears throat> um, 10, at most 20% of the overall duration um, should and could be a video presentation. And I will meet with you during, before the midterm, to coach you, to help you prepare for your presentation on a one-by-one -one basis. So all these conditions and constraints will be published on KLMS so that everybody here, all students who are enrolled in this course and who have been assigned a topic from the book will hopefully be able <clears throat> to get a passing grade. So that being said, with the administrative matters out of the way, let's recall what we already covered um, in the last session about the history of computing. So this is where I'm going to start the uh, slides. Yes. So we've already settled administrative matters. We have been assigned student topics We've talked about the history of computing. I want to recall Moore's law and power of abstraction, principles and models of computing in this chapter zero introduction. So these were the topics. <clears throat> and if you have a question for this topic, your topic, then please don't hesitate to reach out. Also, I will reach out to you and to arrange for one-on-one -on -one meetings, online meetings, to coach you towards your presentation. We've talked about early computers like Abacus or this <clears throat> early analog computer model of the solar system, Pascal's, Blaise Pascal's um, calculator and um, Babbage's analytical engine which was invented in 1837, but which was not built until, I think, in this century, because the technology was not ready, but the ideas were there. That's the theory, in a sense, was ready and provided guidance to engineers, but the engineers <clears throat> took some century until they were ready to actually implement the ideas of Babbage. Then <clears throat> about a digital computer, I reminded you of Alan Turing in 1936, uh, publishing this famous paper on computable numbers with application to the Entscheidungsproblem, five years before Konrad Zuse Z3 became operational. So here you see Alan Turing, and you here you see Konrad Zuse next to a replica of his Z3 machine, the Z3 machine, and also the 
previous machines, Z2 and Z1, were destroyed during the war. So they built these machines during the Second World War, but they were destroyed during the Second World War, and later replicas were built for museum. So that's Alan Turing thinking ahead five years and providing guidance to engineers like Zuse. And uh, in his paper, Turing first defined a mathematical model of a digital computer. He demonstrated its fundamental capabilities, such as doing arithmetic, addition, multiplication, and more complicated calculations, including and that's maybe one of the most important contributions, a universal Turing machine, which was able to simulate any other Turing machine. And in our days, we would say, interpret a program for a given Turing machine on a universal Turing machine. Turing also proved the limitations of his machine. Namely, he proved that it is fundamentally unable to decide the halting problem Given any amount of time, given any amount of computational resources, this was a shown to be fundamentally intractable. And in this way, he kind of uh, provided the framework of what is possible and what is impossible. And then engineers could and would step up and actually build this machine. The second example we discussed is about analog computers. Roughly in the same time, Vannevar Bush built a general purpose analog computer at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Here you see a picture of Bush together with his uh, general purpose analog computer. Several of these computers were built and were sold and shipped to other institutions. And one of the operators of this computer was Claude Shannon, young Claude Shannon. And after operating this machine for some time, he started to develop, to develop a mathematical theory of this machine. And this became famous. So here you see a picture of Claude Shannon. Shannon is uh, famous for many things. The father of information theory is sometimes called but here's one important contribution, this mathematical theory of the differential analyzer. And in this paper, 1941, roughly the same time frame as Turing and Zuse, he defined a mathematical model of an analog computer. Turing defined a mathematical model of a digital computer. Claude Shannon defined a mathematical model of an analog computer. He proved he showed its fundamental capabilities, such as, for example, able, uh, he constructed a universal analog computer able to solve other analog computers. And he proved its ultimate limitations. Namely, he showed that this analog computer was unable to calculate the gamma function. Remember, the gamma function is this... Uh, um, um, extension of the uh, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, factorial function to non-integer arguments. And he also proved that the Riemann zeta function is also not, cannot be computed by this mathematical model of an analog computer. But here the history went in the other direction as in the case of Turing and Zuse. The analog computer was built first and used by Claude Shannon as guidance for his mathematical theory. So here engineering first, then mathematical theory. <clears throat> In the case of Turing and Zuse, <clears throat> first the mathematical theory and then the engineering. And since then, digital computing has uh, exhibited a tremendous raise of growth in performance and uh, ubiquity, whereas analog computers arguably have been stalled or maybe shunned, maybe not deliberately, but because the, the focus just shifted towards digital computer, 
because technology progressed so fast regarding digital computers. And this is captured within the Moore's law. Here is here picture of uh, Moore's law and, and the historical development uh, of computer performance, the number of transistors, but related also the clock frequency. And roughly every two years, the number of transistors doubled. And that held true for a very long uh, time frame of, uh, let's say, roughly from 1940 to 2000. After 2000, there has been some deviation from Moore's law. Uh, the number of transistors did not double anymore every two years. First, it took three years, then four years, and it seems that like they entered some saturation. And then that makes people wonder and question, how can we continue? What is the future of computing? And here you see in this picture, will it be optical computing? Will it be quantum computing or DNA computing, which are three of the uh, types of unconventional computing we will cover in this course. And we will cover many more unconventional models of computing. But notice that this, this graphics is from 2013, right? So in a sense, this is already outdated. And currently, there's a big hype about quantum computing. But this hype is already also showing signs of collapsing. And the question really remains open, what is the future of computing? And one huge um, uh, paradigm that enabled all this progress is abstraction. If you think about a computer, it, uh, its devices range from very, very small nanometer to, well, human size like uh, uh, foot, right? So computers roughly one foot long or wide or deep. And on this huge scale, spatial scale, there are many levels, many layers where computing happens. And each layer um, is de developed independently. That's the only way that humans can cover this huge range by um, having sim similar, different um, um, teams work on different layers of abstraction. So let me recall for you that the basic um, operation, the basic constituent of our, our PCs nowadays still is a transistor. Here you see a replica of the, the world's first transistor, which basically operates as a controlled switch. So the input signal can determine whether the data signal passes through or not. And the explanation why the transistor has this behavior requires advanced knowledge in many bottom many particle quantum mechanics. That this is a so-called semiconductor, and the explanation, the um, physical theory, how the electrons behave in such a semiconductor is a very advanced and sophisticated one. But fortunately. You and we don't need to know about this. In order to use a computer, we simply know that it is a transistor with this controlled uh, switch behavior. The gate signal controls where the signal passes through uh, from to the emitter. That's a single transistor, then combining transistors um, onto a, a circuit putting that circuit into an integrated circuit, combining integrated circuits on a board, miniaturizing this board into a, a CPU, putting that CPU on a motherboard together with main memory RAM. That constitutes common computer hardware. And now we proceed. Next layers are about software, 
The software which provides the interface to the hardware is called Basic Input Output System. On top of that are the device drivers. On top of that is the operating system. And that's where the user level starts with object library and high level programming languages. On all that combined into a digital computer as you know it, or such a digital computer. And uh, we can freely switch from one to another because of all this abstraction, we can replace one operating system with another and keep the high level programming language uh, programs running independently. We can replace one hardware with another. That's all the power of abstraction. Going back down, nobody needs to study quantum mechanics in order to use a computer nowadays. Now the principles of computing are that we have very few and very simple basic primitive operations. Operations or logical gates or cells, later when we talk about um, um, uh, cellular computing. And these few and simple basic primitives are then combined, in this case in layers, to realize very complex behavior such as uh, a PC or a laptop computer. We combine billions of these basic transistors, for example, or billions of logic gates. And as I mentioned, cellular computing, the same is true for cellular automata. There are very few uh, basic principles that, uh, sorry, explain or govern how each cell uh, behaves depending on its neighbors and still in their combination they exhibit this very complex behavior and the same is also true for a bus analog computer although arguably here the basic principles the basic units are more complex and there are not so many of them here there are only eight of them and you can imagine an analog computer with, uh, if it is possible to miniaturize each of these devices and then combine not eight, but one billion of them, what a powerful machine that would be. But this is something that uh, probably will happen in the next years because um, development of analog computers has been stalling for the past 50 years. So that's kind of a prediction to the future and one thing we want to cover in this course. Now, in order to theoretically develop such uh, guidance for engineers, we need to talk about the model of computing. Remember that Alan Turing devised a mathematical model of a digital computer and uh, uh, Claude Shannon devised a mathematical model of an analog computer. What is that? This such a mathematical model rigorously defines what are the basic print primitives, what are the basic operations, the basic gates, the basic cells, and rules on how these can be combined and how they cannot be combined. This is maybe so obvious, but it's therefore it's important to spell it out and rules that explain how these combined basic primitives behave, what is their resulting behavior, and thus how their combination uh, altogether results in advanced uh, functionality. And this is sometimes called syntax and semantics, which are important principles for mathematical logic to distinguish syntax and semantics. And these are Principles also apply here. So to conclude, um, in this introduction, we talked about history of computing, Moore's law, power of abstraction, and principles and models of computing. And now I'm going to show you um, a video 
about uh, the various kinds of uh, unconventional computing that we will cover in this course. So sharing has stopped. And now I'm going to turn on the video.